next question is pretty important. Give me a share. Um, so you, you mentioned Sherpa Romeo mm -hmm. to talk about uh, self-archiving policies. I first came across this by accident. <laughs> well, not by accident. I'm searching for how to find out these things. Who, who runs Sherpa Romeo? Uh, uh, do you know? Is it Sheffield? Stuart's job? Yes. So, so funding is from JIS. Yes. Yeah. What, what's JIS? JIS is... Um, Joint. It's, it, uh, it's just JIS. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, it's a... Like, uh, 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 a UK-wide um, kind of an infrastructure body for higher education. Like it used to be a government department and eventually spun off to be its an individual kind of company. I used to work on it. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's super handy, but I think it's still not well known that it's, it's there to check. It's, it's used in the background in the various repositories as well, so it's used as a kind of data source for machine-to-machine stuff so okay. hopefully it's powering some stuff that is easy to find but it is really useful. Anybody? Phil? Thanks Matty. If not then uh, feel free to. So what about discoverability then? So if you want a question what about discoverability? <laughs> so when you so for example when you're looking at uh, is preprints in institutional repositories <laughs> Um, there's a there's a significant infrastructure around things like DOIs yes. and around. So how is that all gonna how is that gonna connect up to versions of record? What are some of the issues around that? Pass. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> um, so in, in Akai, for instance, you have uh, very few metadata, but one of them usually says where the print has been submitted to. You can come back to the record and update it, uh, even providing the DOI. Once the read the DOI, was a little pointing at the final. Sorry, uh, should I repeat everything? Uh, so, Archive has uh, a few metadata uh, elements together with the preprints. Uh, one of them is usually the journal to which uh, this preprint has been submitted for official publication. The author is normally able to come back to the, that page and update uh, that metadata element, including the DOI when the paper has been uh, accepted and published. That, this also happens in, in institutional repositories. It's mainly the author's uh, task to make sure that the information is up to date. Right. So in that sense, the, the repository is acting as a, uh, an open access green archive for a published object that's somewhere else that may or may not be behind a paywall. It's not acting as, the repository isn't acting as a, a publisher itself. It's not actually making, it's not actually uh, necessarily having search engine optimization or pushing things out or disseminating or anything like that. It's acting as a static archive to be linked to from the existing publishing infrastructure. Uh, not exactly. So because there are so many repositories, uh, visibility is, is very important and uh, there is lots of collaborative work across institutions to, for instance, tweet uh, every item that gets deposited, uh, to work on discoverability, so system interoperability so that uh, papers will appear when Googling, papers in repositories, uh, that uh, they will appear in PubMed, uh, they will appear in as many places as possible in as high a position in the result list as possible. Yeah, and one of the problems that I see with it is um, is is the one of of purely discoverability. It's the search engine optimization helps with getting things on the first page of Google and getting things above the fold of Google, uh, and that's that's a part of it. Um, the other part of it is integration into things like knowledge bases, so that so that it can be accessed through um, search platforms and libraries, information portals, and that sort of thing. Uh, it's very hard for an individual researcher who's looking for a piece of research. You know, they're not necessarily looking for what's happened recently at Oxford University in the biochemistry department. That's not the search that people do. You know, they're looking for a subject, they're looking for a topic, they're looking for a specific piece of information, and then they want to go to some kind of aggregated search platform and link out to it. And that's where the knowledge base comes in, right? Because that provides the link from that a and I index or that knowledge portal into the repository. So how much work is being done there to make sure that things get linked up so that people know that they have legal access to a particular copy that maybe, you know, I don't know, is in the University of Warwick's preprint server or something? 
that they might not necessarily know to look there. So this is an ongoing uh, work line. Uh, you have a you know, bit of infrastructure like a core, which is run by uh, the Open University in the Philippines, which aggregates all the content uh, in repositories and contains this uh, service suggesting you additional items that you might be interested in, in checking when you do a, a, a research something in there. There is ongoing work in terms of integrating uh, repositories with uh, the CRIS systems, the knowledge bases at institutions. Uh, these are very frequently commercial uh, platforms, so it takes a while for, for this interoperability to happen. It's, it's an area, that, I mean, there is room for improvement very clearly, but it's an area where, where lots of work is going on at the moment. So it is some, some kind of answer. I think in the case of Archive as well, it's such a robust community, and the seven areas actually quite dynamic, that you would, it would be worth your time to research <coughs> just that space in a way that you know, some other repository you wouldn't do that in that particular case. That's a very kind of robust resource that you would just go and look at as the place to go for cutting edge research in that field. Right, but Archive covers are an ever expanding group. But when Archive was just about high energy physics, I think that's completely true. But it's well, with thematic research, cross disciplinary research, people are looking in other people's subject fields. Sure, I mean, but it's still a place of high energy physics, that's the place that you would go to. Yes. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. Some of the other stuff that's in there, maybe you need to find some places. I would like to comment, uh, Graham, on the relevant uh, popularity of preprints in terms of uh, research, assess uh, research assessment processes in the US, especially, where tenure committees, etc., are increasingly accepting them. Yeah, yeah that's what I think it's, there's, it's starting to be considered. So I think that's a very, a very embryonic case stage in terms of the tenure, whether or not preprint to account, so I think at the moment it's doesn't really count at all, but I think we're starting to see and maybe a bit of movement, but that, that's going to take quite a, quite a few years, I would think, before they're taken even more even more seriously. But again, this is mainly because they're not peer-reviewed, but it's, yeah, it's a bit important there, getting your work out. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, my uh, last co-authored uh, paper uh, was due to be published I think it was an Indian based legit open access head journal and it was accepted, it's past peer review and they kept on saying, oh, it'll be next month, next month, next month. And it's, it's never came out, so we ended up by preprint things and stuck it up on a uh, peer J. Uh, with hindsight, we should check with the journal because they actually practiced the Ingle finger rule and they found out that we published the preprints and they said, we, we can't publish it now. And we tried to get it to taken off. It was, it was our mistake, we just didn't think about it properly. But went back to PRG and said, Can you please delete so we can actually get published? And uh, once you're on uh, PRG, same as it, fix you, you can't take it down. Well, you can technically take it down, but the rules are once it's up, once it's public domain. But that's just another reminder because it struck me personally with it. Always check um, with your journal through Shepherd to make sure you're okay to post to see if that kind of bullshit happening. You know? What's interesting is that there are some publishers uh, that are, I was about to say the name of the publisher, but that's, uh, that's not public information. Sure. There are some publishers which are um, creating their own preprint service. Um, yes. So I, yes. I presume that the idea from their, I know which one yeah, from their perspective is to, uh, is to create a, a system whereby people submit their preprint to their preprint service and then go on to be yes. published in their journal. Yes. So it all sits within the publisher. Yes. To what extent, and this is a question to everybody, is that in conflict with preprint uh, activities that are going on in libraries? And how do you think that's all going to play out? I think one of the types would to do it, but it's they're sort of made, making up their own rules, so to speak. Yeah. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, services in, in comparison to that. Like say, yeah. the Biarchive, at the moment, you can publish, if you get your, your paper from Biarchive, you can then directly submit through their system to a, a journal of your choice. There's not maybe a massive choice, but a publisher trying to do it all in-house is a bit us, us, us. But they're entitled to do it. But personally, I wouldn't fear about it. I think it's sort of interesting because you can, 
right? There's, there's two things. First of all, um, um, you could see everything that was being submitted to that journal, which just as a, an employeristic way, the curious employeristic way, would be interesting. Do I think it's healthy? Uh, probably not. Um, uh, what happens if you don't? Is uh, if you end up if you submit but get rejected from that journal, do you then take it out of their preprint server to submit it to a preprint server to submit it to another journal? It, it seems like yeah. a bit of a conflict. Or you'll be able to tell what preprints have been rejected from that journal without the authors wanting to say it, and that that seems somewhat mm, I don't know if unethical is the right word, but uh, yeah. uh, it, it, it seems a bit dodgy. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, the way that, the way that these things are positioned, I believe, um, is that uh, the preprint server is positioned as a separate entity from the journal entirely. But it's nice and easy once you've submitted the preprint to submit to the journal. You know, so it's a path, it creates a path of least resistance, right. if you like. Um, yeah, so, so it's, I mean, I, yeah, it's a, it's a question. And the thing is, if we want preprints to be more in the domain of, of libraries and more in the domain of, of academia as opposed to publishers, that means that academia is going to have to create the infrastructure to outcompete what publishers are going to do. And they're going to be on top of linking into things like um, Scopus and Web of Science and knowledge bases and things like that. And they're going to be very good at making their content aggregated and discoverable because that's what they've been doing for the past 30, 40 years and they're doing a very good job of it. They have a lot of practice doing that. So it's a competitive, it's a potential competitive relationship. So I'm interested to see how that's going to play out over the next few years. Yeah, uh, interesting what you say about making it discoverable uh, because with Scopus and Web of Knowledge ever accept preprints, they, they're pretty stingy about what they, what they accept as public, I mean, I published papers in LCA journals that take a long time to turn up on those those services. You know, except for a paper that no exists and I can't find it on them. Yeah. Well, things like Google Scholar will pick up preprints from BioArchive within a week or two. Um, there's a question: Does it matter if you know, like how discoverable things are? Because they seem discoverable enough with the current preprint services. I, I think people get the updates they through in their mailbox if they yeah. set up updates and search engines. Yes. Do you really well, want to give up the control of having an independent preprint server, and then given uh, you know that there's so many issues that people have raised with the profit profit making journals? Do you really want to give up more uh, rights to the journals? When is, is it really necessary? Yeah, well, personally, I don't have an opinion because I'm not a researcher. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I can see why I can see why people would want to have multiple copies of research available. Um, not available, stored by different stakeholders. Right. Diversifying the scholarly system makes sense to me because lots of copies keep stuff safe, right? There's a company that's called that. Um, so yes, so I, I see there's a healthiness about having it distributed. Um, my fear is that it requires an awful lot of community-based organisation to make sure that they, it becomes a sustainable and a competitive workflow. I mean, another area that is an worth mentioning is the so-called Platinum Open Access, yes. namely the overlay journals that uh, let's say that the, the most uh, radical uh, academics. Uh, it's 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 had it's had some uptake, uh, especially in, in Europe. Uh, they say, uh, I mean, you have lots of preprints out there. Why not put together an overlay journal where we ask? researchers to submit papers that are already available uh, as preprints and we will kind of organize them into issues of a journal that will be free, that will be open and that will be curated from academia without a publisher. As such, this is searching flowers, uh, particularly he just delivered a keynote at uh, so the Tim Tim Gellers. Excuse me? Tim Gellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such an invitation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Understandably so. so is, is full of uh, very good papers, very good preprints on mathematics. It's it's not difficult for him to put together a team that will peer review, will select a few of those papers aligned at 
automatically and put out uh, issues of a journal uh, with, with no charges. Yeah. But that, that's what, uh, or a similar note say, in terms of the platform open access, that, that's the same as say, open library of humanities. Yeah. And as we know with the, the recent uh, Wealth and Trust schemes with the uh, Gates, uh, with uh, so the F1000 partnering with uh, Wealth and Gates, and I did uh, try and press uh, Michael, but it's, it's public domain, but uh, there's a big uh, EU uh, platform that's about to also launch using the same system, again, that's a platform of open access, but compared to the other ones, I mean, the, the Gates one is potentially going to be huge. Wellcome Trust is relatively small, I think there's only been about maybe 50 papers, I haven't looked for a couple of months, but if, if, it goes to, if this goes to an EU-wide platform, that's going to have major applications. And if it's, if it's going to be on a, on a, a platinum open access model, whether F1000s can handle that kind of volume and whether they should, Handle that kind of that's a different question, but I'm certainly all for it. Don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not fully sure that's a platinum open access. Um, maybe our definitions of platinum are slightly different. Maybe. Uh, so yes, but they're similar. But is there a preprint available? Well, th th this is more just the publishing in general. We yeah. can move it away from Yeah, then it's for the different right. uh, uh, definitions. Eh? But what's, what's your definition of? Uh, uh, platinum is an you know, overlay journal. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, putting together preprints that are already available out there. So it's a bit like Scope 3, which is another interesting mm -hmm. initiative to look at. The recent presentation I've seen for Scope 3, so high energy physics, uh, collaboratively, collaboratively paid uh, across countries and institutions. Uh, all the papers are available uh, as preprints. The authors will still be interested in getting them published. The Scope 3 team, they yeah. have been looking at the biometrics of the two options. So how often are preprints cited and uh, visited, downloaded, etc. versus the same articles in uh, an official journal, or uh, uh, in a fully organized journal uh, in high energy physics. Uh, I was checking just in case I could find the reference, I couldn't, but it could probably be relevant for this. Hey, but, but that's all spot on. What, what I think uh, threw me was the, was the word is platinum. This is just the alphabet soup, but in terms of a moving away from a preprint, but just the open access publishing, obviously we know about green and gold, but the definition of platinum in that perspective is it's free to the author, it's free to the reader. And that, that and because well, in the case of Open Library of Humanities, that's funded by uh, libraries. That, again, it's back to the uh, money is involved in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but the word uh, platinum, the, the use of the word uh, platinum, from what you're seeing, uh, is slightly different from, from, the, from the use of the word in what I was saying. That's right. There's maybe slight confusion in that term. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it is an unconference session, as you know, but I think that's probably a wrap. Unless you get any bonding things you want to discuss as a group. I'll ask you a question. Yes. Where do you think preprints are going? What, what do you think the future is for preprints? I know it's a big, big question. Probably too big. But they're, they're, they're certainly not going in the bin. But uh, I, I, I kind of very really hopes that from that uh, talk and the, the graphs and the data. That I showed you that you know, uh, you know, there's, there's been a huge boom in the last few years. As I said, it, or as I alluded to, it was actually quite hard for me to keep up with the Wikipedia. It was like a, a one phase, it was a, every week uh, there's, there was a new one. But I'll come to that, your question in a second. Uh, but there's, there's a currently, as per my talk, there's two uh, similar entities for a central housing place for preprints. One is a ASAP Bio, the other is Centre of Open Science. They're kind of uh, duking it out as to which one it's going to be, but back to your question, I, you know, I, I think this, the information is quite uh, clear that the uh, use uh, uh, and the uptake of preprints is on the rise. There, there's, no, there's no question of that. It will, it will plateau at some point, same as a uh, plus one did, but uh, I'm all for, for preprints. Yeah. Get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Why wait? But how, how long did plus one take to plateau? Uh, they, they launched in late 2006, 
and they probably plateaued uh, roughly two years ago. Hmm. But I, I remember some of the graphs that I made for talks in the years they passed that, and you just look at the continued day growth, and at the time I was just thinking, this is just going to go on and on and on, but uh, no. And as we, as we know at uh, present, in terms of the mega journals, uh, with uh, uh, scientific reports from Nature Publishing Group slash whoever they're uh, working with, there's so many publishers keep on buying each other over type thing. But yeah, at the moment, uh, plus, plus one's uh, probably uh, number, number two in the charts in terms of uh, mega, mega journals with the uh, scientific reports taking over. They're still kind of uh, neck and neck have been following for some time, but you know, they did definitely peak. Uh, the fact that they increased their APCs didn't help, given the profits that they had. Uh, in my view, uh, they should have actually brought down APCs, but I don't know the full internal workings of, of PLOS. But didn't PLOS release it recently release uh, their like annual budget and and they said uh, I remember reading it and thinking uh, that the bottom line was that they made forty and I thought forty dollars oh well they must have been really keeping the article yeah. process charged but then I saw the small print which was forty million yes a very profitable venture that, that was probably a tweet for me that you saw but say uh, that was their two thousand fifteen data which came out probably around about a year ago um, but yeah the same. They could probably afford to make their articles a bit cheaper for, for authors then. Well, that, that, that's not in my view, but say, I'm, I'm not yeah. a publisher, you know? What other APCs? Sorry? What, what level of the APC set up these Plus one were 1,250, I think they're now up to 1,450, I think. But in the previous year, when you've made a profit of like you know, 30, 40 million dollars, it's like, yeah. But yeah, as we know, the publishing industry is a sort of 10 billion dollar industry. It's a, Massive one, but uh, that's a whole different uh, that's a whole different story. Anyway, thank you, guys. Thanks, Green.